Did you know that the I2C communication protocol was developed over 40 years ago? And as with a lot of things that were developed 40 years ago, it needs an update. Don't get me wrong, I2C is still a great fit for a lot of applications. But when it comes to current and next generation automotive, IoT, and mobile designs, our communication protocols need to be higher speed, have greater flexibility, and support lower operating voltages. And along came I3C. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Toby Sinkinson from Microchip and I explore the benefits of I3C. We also examine how I3C helps simplify sensor networks and provides standardization for commonly performed functions. And how you can get started using Microchip's I3C modules in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. Hi, Toby. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Amelia. It's really great to be on this excellent series. Thank you. So, Toby, we're talking all about I3C today, but what exactly is I3C? So I3C is the improved inter-integrated circuit. So it's an enhancement of the I squared C communication protocol. And those enhancements mean that it's a fast, low cost, low powered managed two wire bus. And lots of attention has been made to make sure that it's backward compatible with I squared C. And today, so you can see here that we have both I squared C and I3C devices on an I3C bus. Today, there are two versions of the spec. We have both a public version and a membership version. The public version is called I3C Basic. It's free and it bundles all the most commonly needed features that you have in the membership version. Fantastic. Now, I2C and SPY are proven communication protocols. Toby, why is there a need for I3C? Well, the short answer is those protocols don't meet the needs of the next generation of devices. So to put it in perspective, I squared C was released 40 years ago and a testament to its ingenuity, it's still being used today. It's not likely to disappear anytime soon. And in fact, 20 years after it was released, SM Bus came out for smart battery communication and showed us how we could work interoperate on top of an I squared C bus. And that really paved the way for where I3C would go. Today, though, modern electronics have a lot of different needs than they did 40 years ago. We've got more sensors. The thing with I2C is you add more sensors to that bus, you reach a tipping point where the bus becomes unusable. We're also trying to fit our designs into smaller spaces. We need lower power requirements, and we need faster data transfers so that that bus can be idle and have more devices on it. So back in 2013, there was a small working group at the MIPI Alliance, so that's the Mobile Industry Processor Interface Group, and they started working on a design that would address these needs. They wanted to leverage the best of I squared C, SPI, and UART, and three years later, they came out with the I3C spec in 2016. So it's been out for a while, but it's really starting to gain traction now. Fantastic. So, Toby, talk to me about the new features in I3C that that MIPI Alliance created to address these needs. Well, they fall into three main buckets. There's improvements in speed, improvements in power consumption, and improvements in flexibility. In terms of speed, the I3C clock can now operate up to 12.5 megahertz. In terms of power, I3C adds an additional operating voltage down at 1.2 volts. So that's a big power consumption that you'll see. And in terms of flexibility, in I3C, you controllers can now dynamically assign addresses to the devices on the bus. That paves the way for hot join support where devices can join a pre-configured bus. You also have in-band interrupts, which means these interrupts happen on the bus itself. You don't have to have external signal paths. And you've got reset ability. So target controllers can reset all of the targets or a single target on the bus. And there's also built-in error detection now and recovery. So Toby, that's quite a few new features. Maybe can we dig into them individually? And can you talk to me a bit more about how I3C achieves both faster speeds and lower power? 
Yeah, sure. So we already mentioned earlier that being able to operate at that lower voltage gives you a lot of power consumption savings. However, there's an even finer detail here, and that is the fact that I3C leverages both an open drain and a push-pull configuration. So in I2C, you're exclusively using the open drain configuration. That means all of your currents always being drawn through a pull-up resistor, which causes more power consumption. Also means you have to go slower to meet those rise times. But the advantage in I2C is that you can have two-way communication or bi-directional communication during the transaction. In contrast, SPI is in the push-pull configuration and doesn't have that pull-up resistor, so it's going to use less power. It can be faster because you get the faster rise times, but it comes at the expense of communication being only one way during the transaction. So if we take a look here, I've got an example of a typical I3C private write transaction. And we can see at the beginning of the transaction, the clock's moving slower because this is where the controller is now sending the address that it wants to talk to. It sets the write bit to let the device know that it's going to be writing to it. We get an acknowledgement back from the device. But once this is set up, the rest of the transaction does not need to have this two-way communication. So you can see that the next portion here jumps to the push-pull configuration where you have a faster clock your data is transferring faster. And so the majority of the I3C bus line is going to be this kind of push-pull configuration. You're only selectively doing the open drain for a few specific instances. So actually, if we look at a graph now, you can see that the overall effect of this on the left side here, we can see a comparison of the two data rates. Now, this I3C SDR is single data rate. You can see it's remarkably faster than I2C, but this is actually even the lowest you can have high data rate transfers also in I3C, but even this lowest is 30 times faster than I2C because you have the 12.5 megahertz on the I3C side and the typical 400 kilohertz on the I2C side. So again, this means that you're done faster, you're using less power, but what does that look like in terms of energy consumption? Well, we can see on the right side, we're comparing I3C in orange and I2C in blue here, and we compare at different operating voltages. So in 3.3 and 1.8, you can see the jump as you jump down in the voltages is a huge improvement. But even within that single operating range, you can see that by leveraging that push-pull and open-drain configuration, you can see a very large improvement in power consumption. I can definitely see that. Now, Toby, you also mentioned dynamic addressing. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I'd love to. To get an idea of dynamic addressing, I think it's helpful to look at how I2C handles address assignment. So in I2C, devices are addressed by their static addresses. And those are set up when those devices are manufactured. And inadvertently, vendors can choose the same address, and that leads to collisions. And if you've worked on I2C, you've seen this. There's definitely workarounds. It's not a huge deal. But with I3C, we now have dynamic address assignment. So this is an I3C bus here. And we can see what the controller will, when it's ready to assign addresses, it'll broadcast a common command code for a dynamic address assignment. So that goes out, it's received by all the I3C devices on the bus, and then there's an arbitration process, and then afterwards each device receives its own dynamic address. The dynamic address assignment actually is one of many common command codes that are available in I3C, which gives a whole lot of flexibility. So Toby, can you talk a bit more about what common command codes are? Yeah, I'd love to. So I3C protocol introduces a whole suite of common command codes. I've listed a few here to give you an idea of their usefulness, but we just saw one of them, which was the enter dynamic address assignment. And that's an example of a broadcast common command code. So these are command codes that controllers will want to broadcast to all of the devices on the bus, and it can quickly move through all of them. So it's very efficient in that way. But you also have common command codes, or CCCs they're sometimes called, that are specific to a device. So in the case of the target reset action, sure, there may be a time when you need to broadcast that out and have all devices reset. But if you just want to reset one device, you can use this target reset action, which would be an example of a direct write. And then there's also the case where controllers will want to get data from the device. So the get device status would be an example of a direct read command. All right. So... What are in-band interrupts? 
In-band interrupts are a way in I3C that now devices on the bus can signal the controller, but they don't have to have separate signal paths. So in this diagram here of the I squared C, we can see that when this top target needs to send an interrupt, it has to use this separate line in order to interrupt the controller. But in contrast with the I3C design, when that target wants to signal an interrupt, it will send it directly on the I3C bus lines. So this is great, especially for making your designs less complicated. But there's another really nice feature here, and that's that since the controllers are dynamically assigning these addresses, when targets and devices want to signal the interrupt signal, they use their own dynamic address. And so what this means is if a controller wants to give that device a higher priority, when it's a signing its dynamic address, it will make sure that it has the lowest address according to that. So it sets priority by the address itself. Okay, so can you also talk about hot join? Yeah, this feature also comes into play because we have that dynamic address assignment. So let's say you've got a bus and you want to keep your device powered off to save power. It can be powered off even while the bus is pre-configured. All that configuration has happened. And when it's ready to join the bus and send its readings or if it's a sensor, it joins by sending this hot join address, the 7H02, and with the right a bit set and the controller will read that and say, okay, let me give you your new dynamic address. It sends it the dynamic address and away you go. Fantastic. So Toby, what can microchip do for someone wanting to start using I3C? Well, we just, last September, we released the PIC18 Q20. This is the industry's first low pin count microcontroller with I3C support. It's got a number of other notable features like a 10-bit ADC with computation. We've got two PWMs on there and two universal timers. It has a whole host of things that I don't need to get into. I think most people are going to be most excited about this I3C interface, but this is definitely a great part. So let's take a look now at the I3C target module itself. This part, to be clear, is intended to be a target device. It will not have controller capabilities, but it's very useful as we're transitioning to I3C. We'll get into that in just a minute. So here in this block diagram, we can see that this is our 20-pin part, which has two I3C target modules on it. We have a smaller part with just one, but each of these target modules can be connected to the I3C bus. They would both receive their own dynamic address or they could be connected to different I3C buses, say if you have one bus at one voltage and this bus at another voltage. It's worth pointing out though that each of these transmit and receive buffers are directly connected to a direct memory access or DMA. This means that the whole data transfer task is offloaded from the CPU. So that saves us power, helps us stay up with the accelerated transactions. And this module also observes that basic spec we mentioned at the beginning. It has reset support. It operates in single data rate only, but we saw that that's already 30 times faster than I squared C. It's got in-band interrupts and hot join support, error detection and recovery. There are a whole host, 23 different module level interrupts that really allow your application layer to interact with this hardware layer. Our code configurator is great for setting this up with you. This module also operates in sleep mode. And what that means is that the CPU can be sleeping and you can still have this I3C communications occurring as long as that clock is active. And that clock, these parts can go up to 12.9, so that we said that uh, more than adequate to fit the 12.5 megahertz clock as specified in I3C. So the other piece in this diagram to note is this NVIO. So you may be asking what NVIO is. NVIO is on-chip level shifting. So this allows this part to operate in different voltage domains without you having to put in external level shifters. So in this diagram, we can see that this is our PDIP here where the CPU and this set of GPIOs is all supported by VDD. This VD, your main VDD, can have an operating range between 1.8 and 5.5 volts. But you'll see that there are these two other voltage domains that you can have active. Uh, each of these will be for those two additional I3C modules. And these can be set at standard operating range, which would be between 1.6 and 5.5 volts. Actually, if you are running it, this as an I3C, that would be between 1.62 and 3.6 to fit with the I3C spec. But you could also drop down to this lower operating voltage of 0.95 to 1.62 and use that 1.2 voltage specified by I3C. 
So looking at the QN, just to give a, a maybe a more clear of what this looks like in action. So we see here that our Q20 is operating at 5.5 volts, so it can communicate with this I squared C sensor that's also operating at 5 volts. But it has I3C communication with a controller that's operating at 3.3 volts and another line that it's operating at 1.8 volts. So a whole ton of flexibility here as you're adjusting your designs and trying out different things. Excellent. Now, Toby, do you have any examples that show the flexibility of the Q20 in I3C designs? Yeah, I have a few here. So this first example, let's say you have decided to move on to I3C and you have a couple of I3C devices and an I3C controller, but you have these analog sensors and you want to be able to interface with them. If you place a Q20 on this I3C bus, what this sets up is the ability for the controller to calibrate these devices over the I3C lines. The Q20 will pass that along to these sensors, and then the Q20 can now respond to the read commands and transmit the values from these sensors to the I3C controller using the I3C protocol. Another nice feature of this is that since the Q20 is there with these sensors, it can be monitoring them. So once they cross some certain threshold, the Q20 can alert the controller with an in-band interrupt. You don't have these extra signal paths. There's a lot of flexibility there. In another case, we call this the multi-protocol translator. So similarly, let's say you have an SPI device and that device doesn't have an I3C part similar available and you still want to use it. Here, the Q20 can act as the translator so it can receive the I3C communication, translate that to SPI and then SPI back to I3C. That's a very nice feature there. And then you'll notice, wait, so there's I squared C devices here. I thought we said I squared C could operate on I3C bus. And indeed it can, it does. We see that. But one thing that I haven't had a chance to mention yet is that in I3C, controllers have sole control of the clock line. So in I squared C, both targets and controllers had the ability to pull the clock line low. And when devices did that, that was otherwise known as clock stretching. And you do that maybe if you didn't have enough time to pause the communication. That's not possible anymore in I3C. So if you have a situation where you still want to be able to support that, the Q20 acts is a wonderful way to bridge that as we're moving to this next generation communication protocol. All right. So Toby, how soon will we see I3C in new designs? Yeah, that's a great question, right? I will say that I3C is gaining a ton of traction right now. All of the major chip manufacturers like Microchip have already integrated I3C support into their products. I think industries like SSD data centers, where because they're operating at scale, these power improvements have a huge effect on all of our lives and the planet. And there's a lot of good reason there to see this happening there. And in mobile devices, which were you know, one of the main inspirations for I3C, where you need that smaller design, you want to have less complicated and more sensors in there. Those are two places where I think we'll see this very soon. We're already seeing it. But major manufacturers have also backed I3C as the sensor interface standard for the Internet of Things devices. So we're going to see that there too. But ultimately, this is going to depend on when compatible devices are available, how much it costs to start implementing this, and the ease of validating it and market demand in general. But again, this is where the Q20 offers a lot of flexibility as that transition is happening because of some of those examples that I was just showing. So if your viewers are interested in learning more about I3C and the Q20, we've got a development board at Mouser, and this is a great way to get started. We have some excellent code examples for you and tech briefs that actually will walk you through what a hot join looks like, what a private write transaction, read transaction, in-band interrupts, and resets. And it's also very easy to add a I3C protocol analyzer here to your bus and be able to debug and decode these signals. So... Whether your viewers want to set up a bridge to work with legacy devices or the ability to work with multiple voltage domains without external level shifters, this is a great way to get started learning about I3C. So, Toby, if my audience wants even more information about I3C, where should they go? Well, for a more in-depth look into I3C, I do recommend this video called What is I3C? We'll provide the link at the end here. And as well as just downloading the spec from the MIPI Alliance, that's widely available. Fantastic. Well, before I let you go, Toby, can you recap your main points for me? Yeah, sure. 
I3C is going to meet your needs for next and current generation devices. It brings improvements in speed, power consumption, and flexibility. It helps simplify sensor networks and provides standardization for commonly performed functions. Adoption is not going to happen overnight, but the Q20 gives you a lot of flexibility if you're wanting to add I3C to your design with its two I3C modules, its MVIO for on-chip level shifting. If you want to set up a bridge, you've got this low pin count for space constraint design. Awesome. Well, Toby, this was super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, Amelia. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.